The following program is being brought to you on the Voice America Variety Channel. For more information about our network and to check our additional show hosts and topics of interest, please visit voiceamericavariety.com. The Voice America Talk Radio Network is the worldwide leader in live Internet talk radio. Visit voiceamerica.com. The views and ideas expressed on the following program are strictly those of the host or guests and do not necessarily reflect the views and ideas held by the Voice America Talk Radio Network, its staff, and management. Welcome to Bigfoot North with your hosts, Todd Standing and Dr. Jeff Meldrum. Our show explores the remote, unknown wildernesses of the world to discover new species of relic hominids, considered by many to be the most man-like primates on the planet. Now, here are the hosts of Bigfoot North, Todd Standing and Dr. Jeff Meldrum. Well, Todd, I'm very excited tonight to uh, welcome our guest, Dr. Jim Halfpenny. And I'm sure some of our listeners are not familiar with his his background and credentials, which I think are very pertinent to our our uh, subject of conversation tonight. So if I could take just a minute, I'd like to give them a, a little bit of background and introduce him. Um, Jim is a scientist and an educator who specializes in carnivores, in cold region studies, and in tracking as both a technique and as a, a science of study of, of animal behavior. He's an author of over 30 books, including a field guide to mammal tracking in North America and a number of, of guides to bears and wolves. And uh, his, uh, his great love is the bear family. He teaches on-the-ground programs at every location where there's a different uh, kind of bear, different species of bear, including black bears, grizzly bears, brown bears, and polar bears. Um, his polar bear program is in its 25th season. He, uh, he described himself as a, a skeptic, as a, as a scientist, as a practicing scientist. And, and I've appreciated that quality because he, he really does serve as a validity check on, on uh, many of the things that, that uh, I'm interested and that we're interested in, in terms of the, the question of the existence of Sasquatch. And he remains skeptical, but I'd add open-minded, I think, and, and perhaps even a bit intrigued by the, the prospects of the existence of a, of a North American primate. Um, he's president and owner of A Naturalist's World, uh, which is a, an environmental education uh, company and has a wonderful facility there in Gardner, Montana. And I've been just delighted to have the opportunity to, to collaborate with Jim on some uh, workshops that we've been doing now, uh, tracking uh, or teaching and, and, um, and considering tracking techniques uh, in relation to uh, rare and elusive species from Bigfoot to bears and cougars and wolves. And so it's, it's with great pleasure that uh, we welcome you here to join us for this conversation, Jim. Thank you very much, Jeff, and good to have you there too, Todd. Thank you. Thank you for coming on board. We really appreciate it. I'm excited to talk to you. We'll look forward to see what we can discuss here tonight. <laughs> sure. So, so your, your skills in tracking, do you know, uh, do you know Rick Curtis? From uh, from Princeton University? Uh, no, I don't happen to be familiar with the gentleman. Okay, he's he's a person uh, I don't know him at all, but I I study his uh, he has gait patterns where we talk about pacers, diagonal walkers, bounders. Is that the kind of tracking? Is that the sort of science that you follow when it comes to tracking? Uh, certainly, the study of how animals move, their gaits, and the footprint patterns they leave on the ground is very. Uh, critical to what I look at, interpreting the gestalt, the full picture, the story of the animals out there. So uh, we have some similar interests, it sounds like. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, well, I mean, I've, I've, I've studied tracking for uh, 20 years. I started out with what I consider the other elusive species on this, this continent, which was wolverines up in Canada. You know, we have quite a population of them. They're very, they're very interesting and elusive sort of phantom-esque sort of uh, species, so they've been that's how I started out. Actually, was the study of wolverines and especially their tracking. It was, it was good. Do you have any experience with wolverines at all? Most of my career has been tied with wolverines. I do a lot of work with species covered under state and federal laws, endangered species, threatened. Uh, the Forest Service sensitive species, the American marten, Fisher wolverine. I travel North America, Canada, and the United States, teaching people 
how to find these things and to document them with quality evidence that will hold up in uh, legal situations, such as um, you've got a $50 million uh, proposed ski area expansion, and you say there's a links in the middle of it. You can figure there'll be somebody on the other side that says you don't know what you're talking about, and so you have to have quality evidence that will hold up. So yeah, that, and that's absolutely essential for what we're doing, that's for sure. Well, Jim, I'm sure our, our listeners are, are quite interested to to know how it is that, that you're here on this program. How, uh, how did your interest in, in Sasquatch come about, and what were your first... Uh, your first contacts with the subject. Well, gee, Jeff, my memory doesn't go back that far. Uh, <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> growing up, I, the, the library was my home, and I read every book on wildlife, every book on tracking, every book on Sasquatch, every book on polar exploration and mountain climbing. So it came somewhere out of those days for sure. Oh, I see. But I've always dealt with the field of tracking signs, uh, everything from hair, scat, bones, teeth, skulls, antlers, to footprints. And um, as we listed uh, rare species under the Endangered Species Act, that became um, a profession for me as to how to find these species and how to teach others to do that. And as I traveled the country um, uh, for over a decade teaching professional-level seminars, a two-day intensive, extensive program on professional-level tracking. Uh, Grover Krantz, who was an early person in the uh, realm of Bigfoot footprints, uh, traveled with me oftentimes, and I would teach two days, say Saturday, Sunday, and Grover do the evening in between and cover for the professional agencies, the federal and state agencies, all of his work uh, looking for Sasquatch or Bigfoot. And so a lot of my interest came because of Grover. I see. Yeah, when you mentioned that uh, the last time I was up there at the, the tracking school, I, I was unaware that, uh, that Grover had been involved in that kind of thing. What, what, uh, what type of agencies then were, um, were audience to his presentations and yours? Well, the primary sponsor of these was the United States Forest Service. Okay. But we also did programs for the Park Service, State right. Departments of Natural Resources, environmental consultants, and the professional level seminars. Um, soon the lay public wanted in on them. And so we created another program called Snow Tracking Rare Species, professional level. Exactly the same program. I just changed the title and invited the public to it. <laughs> yeah. So we had all sorts of folks there to hear how uh, Grover saw the evolution of the studies of Bigfoot tracks and what his feelings were on uh, how to do it, what the results were, and his beliefs. Hmm. And, and how was that received by the, the agencies in particular? Oh, you would have, just with the general public, a mixed uh, reception from the total skeptics that couldn't be true to those that uh, felt it was. And we even ran across people on occasions that uh, believed that they had actually had an encounter or seen a Bigfoot. Well, that was uh, very similar to the experience I had uh, when uh, John Mianzinski and I went around... Uh, Western Wyoming and visited many of the district offices and of the uh, fish and or game and fish as it's called in Wyoming and U.S. Fish and Wildlife and uh, Forest Service. I I was you know very pleasantly surprised by the very cordial and hospitable reception that we received from from those people and even the even those who professed you know a, a lack of of interest even or or, or total skepticism were still polite and and. Uh, you know, I remember the one individual said, "Well, convince me." <laughs> and so, by the time we'd finished, uh, we'd finished presenting some of the information. He was, at the very least, interested, if not, uh, uh, if, if his curiosity was not piqued. So that's, uh, yeah, that's that's really interesting. I wasn't aware that Grover had been involved with, with that kind of uh, contact with that level of uh, of agency professionals. So, uh, very interesting. So, so what have you numbers, seen? We would have sixty to a hundred <clears throat> attendees at a given seminar. So. 
he reached out to a lot of professional level folks through the years. Yeah, that's yeah, fantastic. Now, what have you seen, Jim? With, I mean, you've got a vast, incredible amount of experience. You must have seen something in the wildernesses throughout North America and even the world. That you have you seen anything that track wise that sort of piqued your curiosity at least? I have never seen anything in the field. And I would put my time in the field up against uh, in most anybody out there. Uh, I've been part of many, many surveys of various types to look for rare species covering thousands of square miles. And no, I have never seen anything. As a scientist, I am open to the hypothesis, but a scientist is a questioning person. That questioning person, as Jeff said, is skeptical. So I'm still looking for the evidence. The um, mm. evidence I've seen has been brought to me by folks like Grover and Jeff who have um, plaster casts of footprints that they can bring in and show, and those are definitely different than anything that I have ever run across in the wild. Mm -hmm. We run an organization called Track Scene Investigation, and... Um, used to be a, I would get about every other week somebody would have something they felt was Bigfoot. It's really dropped off now. It's <laughs> about once every three months, I would say. Um, but what we do is provide a exclusionary service. And if I look at a track and say, hmm, can't be Bigfoot. It was made by a shrew. Game over. <laughs> but if I can't rule it out that way, then Grover started us with five criteria that had helped um, catch or rule out uh, fakes that they knew about. And mm -hmm. if something brought to me fails one of those five criteria, then game over. Mm -hmm. If it passes all five criteria, then I'm going to pack it up and take it over to Jeff. <laughs> yeah. Nice. Yeah, it's fantastic. Now, now, Gosh, it blows my mind that somebody is with as much experience as you haven't hasn't seen. Have you? Did you see Survivor Man Bigfoot with Les Stroud and myself, the TV show? Have you seen that yet? No, I have not. I, I, you know what? I really, I've got to make sure you get a link to it because you'll see things in that in that episode. Uh, I mean, it's very superficial uh, knowledge that I that I showed with Les because it was on national TV, and I am concerned about. Uh, the protection of the species, but you should make sure you make a point of watching that because there are things in that episode that even Les Stroud was, I mean, even when I took Jeff out and, and, and Dr. Brennernagel, in the beginning, they were obviously I mean, highly skeptical of what I was showing them, but I think after days and days in the field, and even you can watch live on Survivor Man Bigfoot for real, what I will stake my reputation on are actual Sasquatch tracks in the moss that you'll see there on the ground after we heard sounds at night, after apples were taken. Really, really profound stuff that, I mean, like I told Jeff, that really adds up to something very significant. And I think it's very important that people like you, I mean, go beyond the tracks. I mean, you know how uh, animals leave all kinds of signs in the wilderness that if you're not aware of it, you wouldn't think anything of it. And I, I would suspect that once you see, even again, what is available on, on Survivor Man Bigfoot, it might start changing the way you look at things. Like maybe, you know, is that really a tree break or how is that tree broken? And you start to analyze and look at things a lot tighter. It's, uh, it's really important, especially, my goodness, <laughs> you are profound evidence that the species could not exist. In my, I mean, if I was sitting here listening to this, and I agree, somebody with your amount of experience is impressive. And to think that you haven't seen a track or haven't seen anything, nothing, no, no, no strange sounds, nothing that's perplexed you in the night, nothing like that? I certainly have seen and heard things that perplex me, but none mm -hmm. that I'm afraid that I could uh, attribute as evidence to the existence mm -hmm. of Bigfoot. Um, well, like what, for example? I'd love to hear even just about the most superficial thing that might just, might not be a big deal to you. Well... You know, as the old saying goes, I've heard bumps and grinds in the dark, but uh -huh. uh, none of those sounds that I would attribute to a uh, large hominid of some sort. Um, mm -hmm. When it comes to signs, I'm not going to miss a sign. I don't care mm -hmm. what it is. Our career is all the signs of animals, and I've not had mm -hmm. one that I could attribute. And if you go to 
uh, things like Monster Quest, you will see me going over their videos and their tracks and so on and uh, showing why the purported things were not made uh, by Bigfoot. Now, as a scientist, I'm still open to the idea. The hypothesis mm. is not disproven, but I've got to see the evidence and haven't seen it yet. I would so love for it. Can you imagine, Jeff, him watching Survivor Man Bigfoot? I would. This is like... This is the most impressive challenge I've had in years. I, I would love for you to watch. I want you to watch Survivor Man Bigfoot and give me a call after and discuss it. This is it would be so exciting for me to hear you look at something and go, I have no explanation for that. I mean, that's what I expect. Or you can come back and say, oh, that's a moose break or, or you know, in your opinion, because I know the level of expertise a great tracker has. They miss. I agree with you. They miss nothing. A blade of grass bent in a certain position means something to them. And to have somebody like you on board for that, I would be – in fact, I would love to have you perhaps even over the phone do a, a breakdown of the whole episode of Survivor Man Bigfoot, both of them, and to see what you had to say. Wow, I'd be so excited about that. I'm sorry, Jeff. I'm just excited to have somebody <laughs> of this level yeah. take on, take me on and say, okay, this is what I have to say after all my experience and a PhD as well. It would be very exciting for me. Yeah. Well, I certainly would like to see those episodes if you can somehow arrange for me to – uh, get a glimpse of them up here in our remote country, internet or something. Um, we will do it tomorrow. Tomorrow you will have those links, I guarantee it, and I'd love to talk to you about it after. Mm-hmm. Well, uh, Jeff, are you there with uh, Todd? No, I'm, I'm in my office, so we're, we're both speaking from from uh, different ends of the Rockies, more or less there, the mid-Rockies. So he, he's well, north of you and I'm south of you. Can you see that he has my website or web address, or shall I give it to you now, Todd? Oh, no, I have it all, and I'll get it from Jeff after. It'll come to you. This okay. is actually something that would be really important to me. I would uh, uh, pe- Having people like you take that next step forward, and, and from my perspective, just so you know, I mean, I know Sasquatch is real. I've filmed them on multiple occasions. I've seen them multiple times. I have zero doubt in my mind. I, th- I actually find it almost, for lack of a better term, offensive that somebody with your level of expertise hasn't been shown these signs, like I've shown Jeff and shown Dr. Benedigo, shown Les Stroud and so many other people. Uh, it just, it's very exciting for me to, to take it to that level. I'm, I'm really looking forward to it, actually. I'm going to clear my schedule tomorrow. <laughs> well, I offered for a decade and a half to go at my cost to the drop of the hat to anywhere that Grover would uh, provide me access to tracks that were fresh. Um, you know, I hear so often, well, there were 27 tracks, and then we lost him. I ain't going to lose him, and I'm going to tell you where it came from. But exactly. nobody's ever taken me to a field site. Jeff has tried, but it just hasn't come together for us. Right. Yeah. Oh. yeah. Well, the time What do you think, been, Jeff? Well, no, I, that, that, that still stands, and I, you know, when, when the LB tracks, uh, trackway came to my attention, when the, when the uh, uh, London trackway came to our attention, you know, uh, the first thing I did was to call or to get in touch with Jim. But unfortunately, the um, you know those po- both didn't seem to pan out and and uh, are now uh, plagued with uh, many many questions. Well, Jim, we're coming up on a break here, and uh, when we come back, I'd like to pick up that thread where. And, and not to put you on the spot, but just to press this point uh, of, of your perception a little further. You know, you said you're, you're waiting for that evidence. I know, in fact, that you have some Sasquatch footprint casts uh, in amongst your uh, vast and extensive wildlife cast collection. I'd like to, I'd like to have you um, just describe for us uh, why they're there and, and what you think of those. You, you mentioned a little bit before, but maybe we can, we can pick that up. So on, on our return from the break, we'll, we'll revisit that issue. The Internet's number one talk station. Number one talk station. VoiceAmerica.com The Jane Goodall Institute is an organization dedicated to continuing to protect critical habitat for chimpanzees and other great apes in Africa. To work with and empower African communities to improve their lives and to encourage young people around the world to take positive action for the planet. Go to janegoodall.org to sign a petition 
get educated and help to ensure great apes have a future on our amazing planet. That's janegoodall.org. There are over 140 million products manufactured worldwide. It is impossible to know the ingredients in these products, especially those made overseas. Stan Salat, Jr., President and CEO of the HSF Mark and the Counterfeit Mark Alliance, is the host of People to People, working together for your safety. Stan believes in our right to know the type and amount of hazardous materials in consumer products and whether they are counterfeit. Find out how you can protect yourself every Tuesday at 2 p.m. Pacific Time, 5 p.m. Eastern on Voice America Variety. The Complete Sylvanic Collection is an online download featuring videos, stills, chronicles, and audio collected by Todd Standing. It is an enormous collection of some of the most significant evidence ever recorded. Visit sylvanic.com or bigfootnorth.com to see these downloads, video footage, and to find out more about Todd's work. You can also find the Bigfoot North products for sale in the online store. Our sightings are just the beginning. Visit sylvanic.com or bigfootnorth.com and see what you're missing. The Internet's number one talk station. Number one talk station. VoiceAmerica.com You are listening to Bigfoot North. If you have a comment about our program or a question for Todd Standing or Dr. Jeff Meldrum, please send an email to info at BigfootNorth.com. That's info at BigfootNorth.com. Now, back to the show. Well, Jim, you have a, a, a beautiful facility, a wonderful facility there in Gardner uh, for, that serves as your tracking school. And I tell you, I, was, I had the most uh, delightful weekend spending that with you and all those students who joined us. I was, it was like I was in, uh, you know, in heaven, surrounded by plaster casts and skulls and, and uh, all kinds of interesting wildlife uh, literature, fantastic library, and... Uh, um, Amongst, I, I was I was gratified to see that there um, on the ca- on the bench that had uh, examples of uh, each of the major um, orders of mammals. There were were uh, uh, casts that you had got some from Grover and some that I had brought up uh, a number of years ago when visiting you, um, prominently displayed amongst your um, cast collection. So, what uh, you, you you mentioned you found these interesting, unusual, but. What do you think the impact or the implications of the growing body of track data that uh, that I've been accumulating? What what impact does that have on on your perception of this? Well, the cats I have in the collection are a pride of the collection. Uh, we like to show um, and be able to analyze uh, what is around it. I would be first to admit that those cats are not something that I can explain, but on the other hand, there are two quite valid alternative hypotheses. There's something right. as yet undocumented um, to an unequivocal level that exists in North America or that they're faked for the right. ones that I have. And I do not have the um, ability to prove either one of those hypotheses but lack of proving the hypotheses at either end does not prove that they came from a Sasquatch. Right. Uh, but still, I, I, as I say, I prize having those in the collection so that we can look at them and um, analyze what might, you know, possibly be out there. Exactly, yeah. Yeah, um, the collection... Well, go ahead. I'm sorry, go ahead. I was just going to say yes, and the the, the co- and the collection is stunning. It, it uh, you know, to be able to pull out multiple examples of of uh, bear footprints and uh, and use those to compare and contrast. You know, when we talked with the students about uh, uh, how to differentiate what may or may not be uh, a Sasquatch track in the field was was just a, a priceless opportunity, really a, a rare. Uh, 
um, a privilege to uh, to see so many examples of uh, uh, of, of bear tracks under ver- uh, collected under varying circumstances. And unequivocally, I can say the casts we have attributed to Bigfoot are not any of the known North American wild animals. There's right. no question that they are something different. Mm-hmm. They're either they're either they're either, and and in your perspective, as you said, and just to clarify a little bit, so you're saying they're either hoaxed or or what, or it's a new species of mammal in North America. That's the two alternative hypotheses. Yes. Okay. Mm-hmm. Excellent. And that's how many times have I heard that? For God's sake, I can't even tell you. <laughs> sure. You'll hear it on Les Strad's episode. Either these videos are real, or they're hoaxed and. Even, but you know, we we even. Do you think, though, you being an expert tracker, do you think tracks will ever be enough for us? Could we get a track? Could we even get enough circumstantial evidence in, in the imagine tracks and DNA, scat, hair samples? Do you think that would be enough to convince science? Will we ever get to that point, or does it have to be a body? Well, lumping all those types of clues together, uh, we need to approach those one at a time. Uh, mm-hmm. Are tracks ever going to Prove that uh, we've got this unknown uh, hominid species. Um, I go back to what Grover Krantz, and I saw Grover evolve over about 15 years, and towards the end of his career, he no longer, he basically said, don't bother to bring me any tracks, any photographs, kill it. <laughs> right. And um, I'm afraid at this point, uh, a single track or an excellent trackway, allows I experience and get to track the animal is not going to convince me. Um, and the same is true of photographs, probably. Uh, mm-hmm. You know, with all the camera phones we've got nowadays, maybe something really good is going to show up. I don't know. Now, when you venture into the realm of DNA, that's getting very interesting. And we've mm-hmm. certainly got um, two people that have been pushing the frontiers of the DNA analysis of hominid primate type uh, samples, be that hair or scat, and um, seem to be constructing a branch on the evolutionary tree that is of something we haven't documented. That would be the first step of a major um, acceptance is that we get that branch clearly defined especially by bold, multiple techniques of modern DNA analysis. I work with DNA stuff of bears. Everywhere there's bears, North America, different kind of bears, I work there. And keep up to date on the bear stuff, and that's directly applicable to samples that we might get from Sasquatch. Mm-hmm. You know, One question I wanted to ask you, Jim, too, is that uh, deals with the DNA and the DNA of bears, and that was the... Uh, the sensational result, uh, as it was presented by the media, of uh, Dr. Brian Sykes, the Oxford human geneticist, of his study, wherein he um, tested some hair samples that were attributed to the Himalayan Yeti and uh, uh, confirmed that they were, in fact, or determined that they were bare. Um, And then there was this interesting wrinkle that when comparing the sequence to databases, they found a nearly perfect match to a 40,000-year-old um, uh, polar bear uh, jaw that was found in Norway. And I, and I remember I mentioned that to you, and it kind of helped me out here. You explained some of the history of the fragmentation and isolation of the polar bear populations and possible introgression or gene flow between them and and the uh, the Asiatic brown bears, what I mean, how would you react to that to that uh, result? What would that signify to you? This this similarity in uh, in genetic markers. Well, I have searched everything I can get to on the internet to get some real results uh, from Dr. Sykes, who is a well known and um, respected geneticist. Uh, so that I could evaluate his results. And the problem is they've not been published. All we've got snippets out of the press, which right. differ dramatically. 
Uh, for example, uh, supposedly this fossil came from Norway, but other sources say it came from Svalbard. Um, and in some places he's attributed to saying it's, it's a perfect match to that sample. In other places he's suggesting it's just a bear. Um, that might be a derivative or even in some places just a polar bear, brown bear cross. I find it very difficult to accept an exact match uh, in something that has been separate for 40,000 years. There would have, the isolation of the Himalayas would have led to genetic uh, uniqueness that should be detected if he did a uh, really thorough sample. So what I'm wondering is, what level of sample did he do? It's right. very intriguing if the Harry's got us from bear, and that does wouldn't surprise me that much. Uh, but the positive link to saying that hair was also the Yeti, um, that I'm not sure about um, as to how much we can credit the hair he had to actually being Yeti. It could have just actually been a bear. And, of course, all bears right. are going to have some sort of relationship to each other. And without uh, knowing, did he try, did he compare it to bears of other types? You know, there's too many unknowns of what right. he said right now. Yeah. I don't think it disproves Yeti. Um, I think it probably proves he had a bear in his hands. Well, exactly, uh, yeah. I yeah, would, for me, this... For me, this whole topic is very frustrating because if he would have called me, I'd have given him ton, I, multiple samples. And I was I was involved with people in the beginning that I was like, yes, I have samples. Yes, I'd love to give them. And somehow I got excluded from this. And I can provide them. Believe me, I can provide. In fact, what I was excited about is what I was trying to get. And I'm still asking Jeff or even or even you, Jim. I have multiple samples that I believe will come back as most. They always come back. They'll come back as unknown species or whatever. That's all great. But what would be very significant is I have different samples from different individuals. Now we're going to say this is a brother. Maybe this is a daughter, mother. Can you imagine how significant that evidence would be? And I've been telling Jeff for for since I met him. Please tell me somebody. I'll give him this DNA. I'd love. Even I'm at the point now where I'll pay for it. Let's get this yep. done. So, well, and, and we, and, and and we're we're trying to um, to uh, sort of regroup after the the somewhat disappointing results of the of the psych study to uh, to do some independent testing, and so we'll certainly follow up on that lead. Uh, mm -hmm. But but before we leave that that notion, I just wanted to kind of, if it really can be tied up, tied up tie up that loose end, Jim. Uh, I, I I appreciate your circumspection, and you're absolutely right. I I think that. Uh, he did a very limited study. My understanding was that he was sequencing the cytochrome oxidase 2 gene within the mitochondria, which is a very limited um, uh, locus, a limited gene sequence, and a very conservative locus that's usually used to differentiate very uh, disparate groups of, of, uh, uh, of animals, of, of uh, mammals, or whatever we're, you're looking at. But, um, and so it was a very narrow window that he was comparing um, but the the press the the, the big uh, uh, catchy uh, segue that the press grabbed onto was that this how some this somehow explained the origin of the polar bears that they may have derived from a Himalayan brown bear as a result of this comparison between these sequences and I and I took exception to that it seemed it seemed in light of what you had told me that it was a much more likely explanation that that the uh, the owner of that jaw may have, if there was indeed any level of similarity to an Asian brown bear, uh, may have um, received that gene through flow from from uh, the mainland brown bears during periods when the polar bears were essentially stranded in these uh, in these fragmented populations when the ice sheets had receded uh, significantly. Well, what I've done is gone as close as I can to the source to find out about that. Right. I went to the University of Oxford and to his web pages and all the stuff that he's got posted. Um, we certainly know that polar bears um, evolved from a brown bear ancestor and that that brown bear ancestor may have 
um, remixed with polar bears after they evolved uh, over in the region of Great Britain, probably up to Norway, Svalbard, and so on. Mm-hmm. Uh, so that all makes sense that there would be elements of brown bear and polar bear in there, too. To find them high in the Himalayas is very intriguing, and I suspect ties more to the brown bear end. It's right. just without his evidence, right? we're speculating. We need to know what he really did, and I oh, can't exactly. find it. Yeah, I, and I think I think once his uh, once his book comes out, and then some of the published papers, we'll be able to talk about it in, from a more informed position. Do you, do you remember offhand the divergence time between the polar bears and brown bears when that uh, that split occurred? Well, it depends on which genetic clock you use. Okay. And estimates have varied from oh, 120 um, to 500 thousand years ago. Um, somewhere in that range, and if the estimates could be a bit confusing by the fact that there does appear to have been a recross in the greater Great Britain area right? that intermingled a lot of female genes in from the brown bears in that area at that time. So I, would, I, I wouldn't want to get too tied down to an exact date on it. Let's sure. just say it's a long time ago, and for that the polar bear genome to get up high in the Himalayas is, is very intriguing. Right. Well, Todd, I, I, uh, I'm I glad to hear that you have those samples. I'm, I'll am i be looking forward to the opportunity to, uh, to, to uh, uh, spearhead and organize some uh, independent testing of, of those samples. Well, you uh, know... Let's stay ahead. with the bears for one second, Jeff. Mm-hmm. And, of course, there's... Or I, I'm sorry, not the bears with the genetic genomes of possible hominids slash Sasquatch. And, of course, there's the work of Melbourne Ketchum, yeah. and uh, where she has found the female con- contribution to be basically human, but then a contribution to something else. I'm greatly intrigued by the fact uh, she's been called into question. There's seven other organizations that have worked on those uh, specimens, and a couple of those organizations I recognize as being quite good on the genetic front. And I'm wondering if uh, we aren't getting more and more of a, um, I don't want to say acceptance, but more and more of a bent by the scientific community to take specimens and look at them in a hardcore manner. Well, right. That's that's my hope as well. I, you know, quite honestly, given uh, given her behavior and her handling of, of the process and the and uh, the the lack of uh, substantiation of many of the claims that she's made and now the very outlandish claims that she has added on to everything I've I've uh, in my mind her her study is quite discredited I have not had the opportunity to pursue or to, or to contact firsthand some of those uh, individuals and those organizations that she purportedly um, employed to examine those samples, or if they were even aware when they were contracted, allegedly, to sequence those samples, that they were aware of what they were dealing with. So it's, uh, and unfortunately, it's just become such a, a quagmire. I don't know if there is any redeeming value in any of the results that she has presented because of the manner in which she has conducted that uh, that research and the dissemination of the results. Right. Uh, she really hurt things, but I have looked at the emails from some of the organizations. Oh. Mm-hmm. For instance, they don't say, oh, we know what this is. They're saying, hey, we got something in our hands. We don't know what it is, but it matches up with hominid. Mm. So, yeah. there's trying to say what it is they're saying something strange that's that's right well well it would warrant a, a closer look perhaps uh we need to investigate the investigators here that's right <laughs> that's right i get investigated all the time i know how it feels <laughs> <laughs> so we're gonna head off for a commercial right away jeff mm-hmm. okay so we'll be back in a in a few minutes with more of uh jim halfpenny
Streaming live, the leader in Internet talk radio, voiceamerica.com. The Complete Sylvanic Collection is an online download featuring videos, stills, chronicles, and audio collected by Todd Standing. It is an enormous collection of some of the most significant evidence ever recorded. Visit sylvanic.com or bigfootnorth.com to see these downloads, video footage, and to find out more about Todd's work. You can also find the Bigfoot North products for sale in the online store. Our sightings are just the beginning. Visit sylvanic.com or bigfootnorth.com and see what you're missing. Conservation starts with us. Learn about environmental concerns each week when you tune in to Our Wild World with host Ellie Weiss. Our show centers on Africa each week and what's being done to save our wildlife, ecology, and ourselves. However, we'll also discuss what's going on closer to home. And most importantly, we'll let you know what can be done in our own backyards by featuring guest experts and featuring your questions and answers. Listen every Monday morning at 8 a.m. Pacific Time, 11 a.m. Eastern Time on the Voice America Variety Channel. The Jane Goodall Institute is an organization dedicated to continuing to protect critical habitat for chimpanzees and other great apes in Africa. To work with and empower African communities to improve their lives and to encourage young people around the world to take positive action for the planet, go to janegoodall.org to sign a petition, get educated, and help to ensure great apes have a future on our amazing planet. That's janegoodall.org. Streaming live, the leader in Internet talk radio. VoiceAmerica.com You are listening to Bigfoot North. If you have a comment about our program or a question for Todd Standing or Dr. Jeff Meldrum, please send an email to info at BigfootNorth.com. That's info at BigfootNorth.com. Now, back to the show. Well, Jim, one one thing I would like to touch on here in this last segment, and then we can we can go any direction that you'd like. But you know, during my weekend up there, you made me aware of this uh, uh, quite extensive study that was conducted on. And now I've I've gone a little fuzzy. Was it on martens or fishers? Well, the study was Fisher and Wolverine. Fisher and basically. Wolverine. Okay. And and it was it was fascinating how the study was uh, undertaken. Um, can you talk about both the implications of the extensiveness of the study, but also the implications of the results for the reliability of of, of eyewitness testimony of rare and elusive species? Well, what we did was we defined. We had an ad hoc committee uh, called the Carnivore Detection Committee, formed by Canadians and Americans. Uh, Alberta, British Columbia, down into the western half of the United States, a few folks in the Great Lakes. And I wrote the detection manual on how to find these rare species. Uh, we determined ahead of time, tried to have a common unit of area. It turns out two miles on a side was the common unit we used. And we looked at methods to provide equal probability of detecting a species if it occurred there. And uh, the methods were cameras, track plate stations, and snow tracking. And if you've got one of those species there, in general, you need to be surveying one of those blocks in the best habitat with a minimum of eight camera stations, eight track plate stations, or three snow tracking surveys over the course of the winter uh, that meet the criteria of good snow tracking surveys. And then everybody involved enlisted everybody we could to help out. Uh, for the northern half, California, Oregon, and Washington, we got together uh, the hunters, the snowmobilers, the hikers, Audubons, uh, universities, fish and wildlife departments, uh, National Wildlife Federation, everybody we could to run a block, two-mile square block, and keep track of the information. But initially, ahead of time, we collected every single report we could of uh, Wolverine, Lynx, Fisher, and Martin, actually. 
and we graded the reports, A, B, C, D, and F. It was an F that was thrown out, and we mapped the reports. And that I would call the picture of what the general public thought was there. And then for several years, we ran these blocks all over. Massive effort up and down that area, um, British Columbia, uh, Washington, Oregon, California, and I really showed you the uh, U.S. component of that in the contiguous states there. Um, and um, the map that shows what the public perceives as where these species are is um, everything's on a two-by-two two dot. It's much smaller, many fewer dots than uh, where we set out the surveys, massive surveys, and then the um, results we isolated uh, population of Fisher in south, southern Oregon and northern uh, California and one in very, well, pretty far south in California, just to try to describe the maps. Um, the actual results where we could prove we had the animal were much, much smaller than public perception of where it was at. Now, interestingly, this survey... Uh, all the stations, we used baited stations, hair snags, uh, were designed to bring in mustelids, so they would have brought in wolverines also. And in those states, there were no wolverines brought in at all. Um, the last wolverine document in Washington, Oregon, is over 100 years ago, and now we've got them coming into Washington. Um, mm. Also interesting and pertinent to our conversation here is this massive effort on although more winter-oriented, uh, certainly in the milder seasons a bit, detected no Bigfoot. Right. Um, so the, per the difference between public perception and what they feel is there and the reality is very small. I can give you another very pertinent study. I've tra trained the largest carnivore tracking group in the world, and for 20 years we've been working the Great Lakes states. I have over 300 trackers who adopt a block and work on it. They take a written exam every year. Uh, they have to do three good surveys each winter, and they have to come in and report them each spring, and we produce a publication each year of all the animals. Wisconsin's the key state, the upper two-thirds of Wisconsin. But a single cougar comes into the west side of the state, and my trackers follow a single cougar completely diagonally across the state. And we've done that on two different occasions. We know it's the same cougar because we get hair out of day beds, scat, we've analyzed it. Both cougars were dispersing males that came from the Black Hills. Uh, one of them left the state, went to Chicago and was shot. The other one left the state and was eventually hit by a car in Connecticut, the longest dispersal of a cougar known. Um, so, you know, we look at the Great Lakes states, and I've got such a massive effort of tracking going on there which is also repeated in a couple of places in Canada. Um, British Columbia and Alberta has some pretty impressive ones going. We haven't come up with a Bigfoot. Right. Yeah. Yeah, it well, does. Uh, and oh. ima imagine it from this perspective, though. What if, what if Bigfoot is uh, an exceptionally intelligent, like, hominid species that is an amazing tracker? What if they can see these things? What if they – I would suspect that the majority of the time when I tell people they put up their cameras, I think if you're in Sasquatch territory, he's going to watch you put that thing up. Never mind the sign that you'll leave around because, again, when you're dealing with a, a species that can track as good as they can, and that's what they are. They're spectacular trackers. It, 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 it brings it to a whole level of difficulty that, that you'll never get with bears or, or wolverines or cougars or anything, if you know what I mean. Well, Todd, how do you explain – their ability not to leave a track in the snow. Well, I don't think anything can avoid tracks in the snow. But what I think they do in the wintertime is I think they get their abundance around October and they get themselves, whether it's an abundance of fish or an abundance of, of red meat or elk or deer, I think they go up into caves. I mean, this is just my hypothesis because I see them so very rarely in the wintertime. But just go up in, in the caves and eat meatsicles and, and whatever, they, whatever they've gathered. To, to survive off that winter in preparation for it. Again, an intelligent species is going to be able to make those kind of preparations, I think. 
So they may be able to make the preparations, but we're talking about surveys that went on from the first snow to the last snow, and uh, none of the surveys detected anything in mm. terms of snow footprints. Well, what, what scares me about that, since I know they are real, is it makes me think, my goodness, how rare is this species actually? Are they that scarce that you're not even picking up on them? Because, again, in my mind, I'll take you out and I'll show you Nordeg, I'll show you my research site, and you'll be convinced. In three days, I can guarantee you, you'll see things that you just will have no explanation for. You'll be looking at stuff just like everybody I've ever taken out does and goes, my God. The apples are gone. These are big tracks. I can't explain what I heard. It's the same thing every single time. And, uh, again, I know they're real is my perspective. I make no apologies for it. So what what you're doing, I mean, I commend you. I think it's wonderful. And this is evidence I need to hear. Just just makes me want to work harder for my species protection and recognition that I've been fighting for. Because, again, I know they're real. My goodness, you're telling me they're even more rare than I ever thought. And that scares me. Jim? Jim, there one point of clarification. You mm-hmm. you made a, sta- you made a sta- statement, and I'm not sure if you misspoke or if I misheard you, but um, the difference between the public's perception versus the real evidence, you said was the difference was small. Did you mean that was large? Are there, I mean, I thought from okay. Exam- uh, poor statement on my part. The okay. difference between the perceptions is quite large. What the public... Um, what we were able to prove was quite small. Exactly, yeah, because when I, I remember seeing those two, two graphs or two figures, one with the reported um, encounters or sightings of these creatures by the, by the public and the one where you were ab- actually able to document with these methodologies their presence, and it was a small fraction by comparison to the public perception, and I, you know, I think if, if nothing else, that's also a very sobering message about the the uh, um, abundance of anecdotal evidence that gets um, uh, you know perpetuated, that gets uh, um, uh, disseminated through social media and and uh, online and everything. Uh, you know, I I think that many of those instances can be dismissed as mis misidentifications or misapprehensions of uh, experiences in the wild. But I, I share Todd's uh, feeling as well. I mean, when, when you, uh, you know, your, your mind, as, as objective and as skeptical as you attempt to be, as I attempt to be, um, when I've had firsthand experiences and when I have um, uh, been impressed by, uh, by evidence, track evidence, you know, the tra- track evidence alone, is is for me personally quite persuasive then then you are confronted with this kind of uh, a study and you have to wonder i guess whether these approaches these methodologies are um would be sensitive to a creature like this uh it, you know the the camera traps and so forth i mean we've notoriously had had difficulty with uh, the dis uh, uh, the dispersal of uh, or deployment of cameras uh, in um, capturing any photographic images, obviously. Uh, things like track plates and, you know, your point of snow tracks is, is, is well taken, but we don't know what their behaviors are um, under different weather, different seasonal conditions, and so forth. But, yeah, that's, I think these are things that we all have to keep in mind as we move ahead with this uh, investigation. Well, Tim, let me ask you this. Are your your methods of, of these cameras and track plates that you do, would they fool you? If you were trying to evade them, could you successfully evade them as an excellent tracker? Uh, the methods we're setting out are certainly not uh, designed to be invisible. But when you look at tactical tracking, that's the people that are trained to ta- track, uh, to kill, and avoid being followed. Um, even those people who are highly trained leave a trail. Mm-hmm. And um, I, you know, you can obviously make the argument that these animals are watching you and don't go near something that's set up. Uh, but the other side of that argument is still the snow tracking. Mm-hmm. Well, in the, in the closing minutes, I'd like to put a, just a, a little plug in for our workshop, Jim. Last year we, I had what uh, 
especially considering the circumstances with the government shutdown and the closure of Yellowstone, we still had a very uh, successful um, workshop that uh, dealt with these uh, forensic techniques of, of evaluating tracks from Bigfoot, bears, cougars, and, and wolves. Um, I mean, what was your... What was your? Uh, have you had any feedback from any of of the students since that time? Or oh yeah, I pick up emails from a couple of them. Uh, mm -hmm. Our workshop is not a workshop to uh, argue for any of the species. Our workshop oh. is a technique workshop, and I would have to say the work you're doing with uh, scanning and the collections that you're putting together, and the stuff we're doing is the cutting edge tracking workshop. The workshop is techniques. For rare species, not the rare species themselves. And right. If anybody's interested in learning where the cutting edge of this science is, come join us because we're going to do another one in the fall. That's right. And you mentioned the scanning. I'm. <clears throat> I'd like our listeners to know too that, uh, as uh, in addition to the many footprints that have been scanned, and and I know I keep saying it, but uh, we've we've got it right on the edge uh, now that the semesters roll into a close. I'll have time to devote to this, and it's at the top of my queue, get the uh, web page up and running so that people can look at the 3D scans of, of this interesting data set of Sasquatch tracks, but you've now agreed to uh, uh, a tentative proposal to allow uh, portions of your extensive wildlife cast collection to be 3D scanned and added to this virtual uh, archive, which I'm just delighted with. It will, it will lend such uh, increased depth and significance to this collection, it'll become a real, uh, uh, you know, a real go-to data set for, for people with many different uh, applications. I'm really happy to provide the uh, specimens. It's uh, in the vein of uh, exclusionary service. I'd like people uh, to be able to look at something and say, ah, oh, positively, that is a wolf, a bear, or a wolverine, or whatever, um, and be able to uh, narrow our potential sample of what might be uh, Bigfoot tracks. Mm. Well, we've got to head out. Next week is John Benrigo, live here on Bigfoot North. Jim, I can't wait to get you out in the field with me, sir. It's a date you can mark on your calendar. It's going to happen, and I'll pay for your flight. <laughs> okay. Thank you very much. And I'll catch up with you very soon, probably tomorrow if you have the time. Everybody, thank you very much for tuning in to Bigfoot North. <laughs> Thank you again for listening to Bigfoot North. Please join Todd Standing and Dr. Jeff Meldrum again next Wednesday at 8 p.m. Eastern Time, 5 p.m. Pacific Time on the Voice America Variety Channel. We'll have another part of the story then.